Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our USOH Warrior Team Hunt Program class on fair chase ethics and a bit on wildlife conservation here in, in Montana and around the country. And I want to thank you all for, for joining us this evening. Uh, this evening, we have with us Everett Headley. He's uh, part of the um, One Montana Master Hunter Lead Instructors, and uh, he's got an awful lot to share with us on, on that this evening. But uh, here we are on June 1st, uh, the day after Memorial Day. And uh, I just really want to, uh, I guess, let everyone know that has lost military family and friends um, that uh, we, we thank you all for your sacrifice as, as much as we do for those that have given their lives in the service of our country and to protect freedom around the world. We really appreciate that, uh, that service, that sacrifice, and want to thank you all uh, for that, for everyone that has paid the ultimate price, and for our Gold Star families, thank you uh, for your sacrifice. And so, um, but uh, I wish we'd had an opportunity to get to everybody together yesterday to to talk about that, but um, here we are the day after. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Everett, um, maybe you can share a little bit on your background and then just uh, go ahead and launch into this. And again, uh, folks, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to jump in and ask and interrupt Everett as you go. Yeah. So it's more interactive. Uh, do I have sharing capability, Steve? I am, I am going to give you that um, multiple participants can share simultaneously. You should have a little green arrow pop up in the bottom there. There you are, you are sharing. Awesome. Great. All right. Awesome, thank you for that effort. I'm gonna hush up and let you have it then. All right guys, um, can everybody see my screen right there? Do you got that Bradley? Mm -hmm. Go by Brad or Bradley? Either one. Yep. And then Christina, are you there? Uh oh, do we not have Christina? Is it just Brad and I? Uh, she's on mute. She she might be doing some other things right now, but she sent us a little chat. Um, okay. That, uh, she's she's going to chime in. She said that when uh, she's available. Gotcha. Give me a second here. I'll pull up chat. Right. Just but, so I can yeah. see. We are seeing your screen there, so you're all good. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started then. So uh, in my my role as the lead instructor for the Master Hunter program here in Montana, uh, I developed curriculum and um, really uh, kind of just cast vision, so to speak, for what we do with the Master Hunter program. We're in our fourth year of classes, and uh, I, I teach two of our classes. So the hunting culture and ethics that you see tonight is really a, an abbreviated version of what I spend uh, uh, over three hours on in, uh, in our Master Hunter program. And then I teach hunting research and resources as well. And so uh, this is something I'm definitely passionate about. You know, my background, um, in dealing with uh, ethics, uh, I have an undergrad and a graduate degree in, in the field. So definitely something that I'm passionate about. And then you put hunting into it as well. And I um, kind of have a, a perfect marriage of, of um, something I can talk a long time about. Uh, there's only two of us here tonight, maybe one and one and a half. Um, so Brad, we're going to, we're going to have some good back and forth tonight. Uh, I can talk a lot, but uh, I'd rather just uh, have some conversation with you about hunting ethics and uh, where we're at here in Montana with, with uh, that. So, uh, Brad, can you give me a little background on, on yourself, like 20 seconds? Sure. I'm born and raised here. I live in Lolo. I was born in Missoula. Um, been hunting since I was 12. Before that with my dad. Yes, I like hunting, fishing. I do archery. Um, I, I 
change my my hunting years ago was more to feed the family and meat and stuff oriented now i do it because i enjoy it if i get something great if not i have more fun um with my son-in-law his brother and i got another younger kid that i hunt with down the bitter it so <clears throat> he kind of adopted and wanted to hunt with me so i kind of hooked up with him and we have a good time i enjoy sharing my knowledge and stuff like that and experiences with them and kind of pass it on mm -hmm. okay uh christina are you there same question for you 20 seconds about you okay um well this uh this will be fun brad you and i um uh, going back and forth here maybe a little bit so uh really just speak up if you've got um questions as we go through can you see my pointer on that screen mm -hmm. just curious okay good um there we go that'd be a little better uh so we've got a handful of pictures here uh of what it looks like when we don't have ethics on our landscape. And that picture on the left, you can see just a, a mound of bison skulls that were collected. Uh, they would ship those back east to be used in, in fertilizer. And you can just see the amount of, uh, of, of, of death really that's that it would take to be find a pile of bones across the Great Plains. Uh, the number of bison um, has been estimated from, from 5 million all the way up to 80 million. And, and, and then uh, towards the end of the 1800s, really saw a decline to, um, some books will tell you 500, some will tell you to, to just 100. In fact, it's really hard to find any bison anymore that don't have um, cattle genes mixed in with them just because uh, there were so few of them and they were doing what they could to kind of keep that that species alive but from market hunting and and then just unregulated hunting you see um, the, the decline of a lot of different species that middle picture there um, here with uh, these bison heads these are from a poaching operation that was in Yellowstone Park when the uh, cavalry was still patrolling it, we didn't have the park service set up yet. And they, they were losing bison um, to poachers who would sell these heads to people back east who wanted one to put above their fireplace because they were all just uh, going away and people knew that. And so there was, there was this unbridled kind of, uh, uh, attitude towards animals where they were exploited. Uh, you can see that picture of the railroad car on the right there, just the amount of waterfowl after one shoot. Uh, dozens of birds there in, in that picture. And it didn't really apply, uh, didn't apply only to uh, wildlife. You know, we used um, hydraulic mining and we clear cut and we could see destruction just across the landscape just because we had this idea that uh, these natural resources could never be depleted. And, and it, it didn't take us very long to figure out that that's not true. And uh, we as a species can, can consume uh, a lot more resources than those resources can replenish themselves. And so it became really clear um, early on that um, uh, there's, there's quite a bit um, that needed to be done. And Christina, I see your comment there. Um, that is uh, your, your, your comment there about not being a hunter. That's totally okay. Uh, a lot of this is just conversation um, that uh, really brings hunting into a, an ethical um, dialogue. But it, if you don't have hunting as your background, uh, that's, that's uh, not too big of a roadblock for us. So I, with it just being you and Brad and I, uh, definitely going to be good to have uh, you chime in. So, what do we have here? Uh, 
a straight line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no trick question there, right? So we got this 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 long black line. And um, can you hazard a guess what you think that might represent? A boundary. Okay, I like that. What do you got, Brad? Um, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Starting an end point, maybe. Okay, so this is the line that we don't cross. So what do you okay. think is on one side of the line and what's on the other? Ethical and unethical. Okay. Good answer. Good thought. Brad, you got a thought? That's about right. Okay. Yeah, so you're on the right track. Okay. <laughs> so on the bottom here, illegal, illegal. Got, we have illegal action. So can you give me an example, maybe one from each of you? Uh, what would be an example of an illegal action in hunting? What do you think might be one? Illegal in hunting, uh, shooting from a vehicle, shooting across somebody else's property, trespassing to shoot on somebody else's property. Okay. So let's take that person. I like that. So shooting from a vehicle. Um, we're just going to, in my game here, that is completely illegal. We're not going to get into the nuances of when that may or may not be legal. Um, so yeah, that's an illegal action. And how do you know that that's actually illegal? Uh, fish and game rules. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the regulations is a really good place to start. Any other thoughts? When it's posted, if you're shooting in somebody's property. Okay. Yeah. Signage or um, something else, it tells you you can't do that. I like that as well. So there, there are definitely ways for us to know and understand what is illegal. And with our, our state regulations, uh, they are actually a summary of the Montana Code, the commission rules uh, that guide and govern how we are allowed to hunt here in Montana. And so really clear stipulations in there on what we can and can't do. In this area below us here in Illegal, this is not a place that we really, we never even want to venture to. So we got this black line right here. And then above it, what do you think might be above that black line? Legal. Yeah. You guys are you guys are catching on quick tonight. <laughs> so, We're the bright ones of the group. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take Christina's example of um, shooting from a vehicle, illegal action. What could we do to make that a legal action? You have to get a permit from the Fish and Game, I believe it is. Okay. Yeah, that's one route that we could go. Whatever. That's one route that we could go. What's another one? Maybe, maybe get out of the car. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe walk a couple of feet off the road. I always go to the fence line. You were going to flat bread? I always Wait. go to the fence line, makes a good rest. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, um, you, you do have to be uh, on the other side of the right of way. And so, whatever that right of way looks like, whether it's a barrel pit, a fence line, um, you know, it's up to you as a hunter to know what what is and what is not uh, the right of way and where you need to be before you can shoot. But yeah, so we have an example of an illegal action, shooting from a vehicle. A legal action, we're going to get outside of the vehicle and get off the roadway or outside of the right of way. So here's where we're going to be going in our conversation. Um, yeah, I have a quick question on that fence line thing. Okay. Well, they tell you so many feet from this or that and whatever. Um, I guess there's probably some fish and game officers that might push that, depending. I know the fish and game officer over East by Great Falls, his name is Dan, that I've dealt with. And he always praised us, and I've known him for years, because we, when we see antelope or whatever, and we happen to be in a rig, we always just go to the fence line and use it as a rest. And he was always said, that's perfect. And I asked him about distance one time. He says, you're not on the road. You're not in a vehicle. <laughs> he says, anybody who would argue with that has issues. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I mean, realistically, are you supposed to pace it off or, you know, and, and yeah. the guy really should, by the time you cross the fence, now you don't have a good rest. I mean, ethically using the fence as a rest is a good idea, right? 
Well, I think using the fence as a rest can be a good idea. Um, I would defer to to whoever teaches your your section on wildlife law and ask him how far do you need to be. Um, I would tell you, you you can't break one law just to have another uh, law be enforced, right? So if you have to be on the other side of the fence, even though it might be the rest you need, you, you need to be on the right side of the fence and then taking an ethical shot. And maybe that means you don't have an ethical shot once you get to that other side. Yeah. Um, or maybe you get some trigger sticks or you get a bipod or whatever else it is that you need. Um, so, you know, good question, Brad. Um, when I come back to the idea here, what we're talking about here in ethics tonight, the, the idea that we're always going to be looking to, um, to help us with, with guiding us through these, these what if questions, like the one you just presented to us is how can we elevate our actions? And so if we're never going to be in this world of illegal, and we're never below this black line, we're always going to be above it and legal. How can we elevate our actions so that they're ethical? So we raise that bar and continue to, to look um, in that direction as we hunt, as we get out of the car, and then we get across the road and we look at what, what is it that we can do to elevate our actions. And so like we just talked about, well, I need to get across the fence line so that I'm legal. Can I use my pack as a rest? Have I practiced with my pack as a rest? Uh, what about, you know, like we just said with a bipod, is that something that we can put into our arsenal so that we can have the most steady shot possible? And so using Christina's example, and I, I think Christina just left, um, using Christina's example of shooting from a car, we move from legal, illegal to legal, and then to ethical. And then again, we're trying to always be raising the bar as we, we talk about our, our hunting ethics. And so um, we talk, when we look at how ethics start to, uh, where the genesis of ethics are and how ethics become, eventually become laws, there's this beginning personal value and beliefs. And this is where if I was in a big class, Brad, I would, uh, I'd start some trouble up and, and I'd ask something like, uh, you know, who, who's a Grizz fan and who's a Cats fan? Or um, I try to keep politics out of the conversations, but I would find, you know, there's something out there that, that we disagree or like Coke versus Pepsi or something like that. And, and we start to get, get them a little bit riled up and ask them, uh, what is it about that drink that they like? And, and what is it about the other drink that's not worth, you know? And so we all have personal values and beliefs. And those start with, uh, um, with us when, when we're young with, with our parents, but also the peer groups that we, we, we uh, associate with. And then as we grow, um, you know, through life experiences, we begin to have uh, some, some refinement of those personal values. And if you do enough things in life, those experiences really start to tell you, you know, that's not quite what I should be doing. When we're really young as kids, uh, you go to touch that stove for the first time and you learn that it's hot and you burn yourself, probably not going to be touching that stove again, right? Uh, you do that enough times and those experiences build over and over and, and they become uh, traditions. And I'm reminded of this story of this uh, young wife who just got married. She was going to make Thanksgiving dinner and uh, our Christmas dinner and they were going to have ham. And they, she took the, the ham and she cut it in half and she put one half in one pan and one half in the other pan. And her husband asked, why, why are you doing that? And she said, well, this is how my mother always did it. And after a few years of this going on, her, her mom comes and visits her um, for Christmas dinner. And she watches her daughter do that. And, and she says, what are you doing? And daughter says, well, I watched you grow up uh, doing it. And she said, yeah, but I had a stove that was so small, I couldn't put the whole ham in the stove at one time. So I had to cut it in half. And sometimes traditions and things just continue to happen, and we don't necessarily know where they came from, but those experiences that we've had build 
into those hunting traditions. And after a while, this is just how we're expected to act. And just like that daughter um, had the expectation uh, that that dinner was was going to be prepared in that way, we have societal expectations. Uh, you know, I think about hunting in the fall, and there's there are societal expectations. Um, when I was going to school, where when it was opening weekend of hunting season, there was pretty much nobody in class. And teachers were okay with that. Sometimes homework was prepared beforehand, but the expectation was that this is what we do as a culture and as a community, and, and this is our tradition. And so the people around us, even if they didn't hunt, this is something that they did themselves. And so after a while, those things that start to um, become societal expectations and how we are uh, expected to act those become codified into law and those are game laws or wildlife laws and that becomes the minimum uh level of behavior that we as as ethical hunters will always adhere to and so you see through this this evolution of ethics into law that they start small and then they build off of each other until we get to this point where we have game laws and so brad you said that you have, you've hunted for a little while um, is there, is there a, a wildlife law that you can think of that might be based on just what society says we should do and, and doesn't necessarily have a, uh, a biological reason behind it? Um, What about um, how we? Uh, how about two guys who are hunting together, both want to, they're, they're meat hunters, we'll call it, right? Okay. So you got cow tags or whatever. And they're not looking for big trophies on their wall. They're looking to fill their freezers. They're together. One's a better shot than the other. One happens to shoot two, both come home with an elk with tags on it. Okay. <laughs> That's against the law. Yeah, that would be against the law uh, for for darn sure. Uh, but but that one, you know, you're, you're only allowed to shoot what you have a license for. So there's a clear. I think there's maybe more of a clear management where you can't just go shoot whatever you want. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you each have, have a cow tag. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it's true. To be that the guy sitting next to you might shoot too because you miss or something. Yeah. You know, and the, the example that I was thinking of was uh, okay. our want our wanton waste law, where the there's a requirement that you take um, a certain amount or certain portions of the animal that you harvest. Okay. And and there's not um, there's not a, a a biological concern behind that. It's not like if you only take half of a deer that the, the the coyotes and wolves aren't going to have enough to eat right there's there's nothing behind that but what society expects from us is that we utilize the animal to the fullest extent that we that we can and part of that is is taking the quarters and the loins and the back straps and maybe some neck meat you know uh, we're not required to take hearts or livers or kidneys or caudal fat but those things are there and they're still edible so you know, that comes back to society expects us to take home whatever it is that we kill and to eat whatever it is that we kill. And, and why is that? Well, our traditions have always been that we went out hunting in order to procure food for us. And in my family growing up with five sisters, we definitely needed meat. Um, and, and so if we didn't, if we didn't get something that, that winter, uh, you know, my parents would have to spend the extra money to get, uh, to get protein at, at the store. And, and those experiences that we have and our personal values and beliefs were that we can go do it, we should go do it, so we are going to go do it, and that, and that we're going to go hunt and, and fill our freezers. And so it's really important that we, we know that um, the minimum that we're expected to act 
those are the wildlife laws that we have today. And so um, it can be difficult sometimes to figure out, well, what, what ethics are we dealing with and, and um, what is and what is not really an, an ethical concern. And the, um, the definition that I have here for, for ethics is it's an unwritten moral principle that guides behavior. And when we break that down just a little bit, uh, it really helps us to understand this moving target a little bit better so that we are able to find a rally point for all of us to kind of say, yeah, we agree with that. That's what is going to unite us as a, as a common group. And that first uh, idea there being uh, ethics are, are something that's intuitively known. And because they're intuitively known, they're inherently hard um, to, to, to define. Um, you know, why you might choose to pass on an animal that otherwise is legal for you to uh, harvest. Uh, that's something that you don't always have the ability to just use words to, to describe. Welcome back, Christina. So sorry, I have a oh. computer that's plugged in. That's okay. Uh, you haven't missed a whole lot. We're just uh, traveling down the road here on defining what ethics are. And so, Obviously, there's this moral part to what ethics, uh, uh, what the definition of ethics should be, that internal conscience that can be subjective, but can also be something that we all agree with. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really interesting if you look at cultures um, across geographical distances, but also chronological distances, they're all universal with a very few exceptions, um, pretty much against murder. You're not allowed to kill your fellow man. And, and so what is it about that that is standardized across time and history um, that really unites some ethical principles in, in people? Well, there's this internal conscience and, and even though it's subjective, it's still something that we as humans still say, okay, we, we can agree with, with that. And, and what these ethics do for us is they help us to avoid pitfalls in the, the gray areas of life. And so if the, it's just not possible for our, our hunting regulations to give you every what if situation and help you, um, and, and help you navigate every possibility that might happen out in, in the, the woods or in the forest or wherever it is that, that you're hunting. And so when we start to talk about ethical hunting behavior, it's those unwritten moral principles that you've thought about previously that are going to be the guiding element for you as you move through it. So, um, for instance, in the fall, um, you know, a white-tailed doe um, comes out of, the, uh, out of the forest and it's got two fawns from that year with it. Is it illegal to shoot that doe? No. No, you can, you can shoot that doe. Um, but when we put our ethics into that, do we start to get a different answer of whether or not we would shoot that, that doe that has two fawns? I wouldn't shoot it. You're going to let it walk, Brad? Huh? You're gonna I let would, it walk. Yes, I let it walk. I had a doe tag this last fall. <laughs> I passed multiple deer till I finally found a decent sized doe that did not have fawns with her. Okay. Okay. Christina, are you gonna are you gonna shoot that doe or are you gonna let her go? No. Okay. What if I were to tell you that statistically those those fawns um, will be just fine without mom? They'll make it through the winter just fine. So so they really don't need mom in order to survive. Does that change your, your thoughts at all on whether you're going to shoot that doe? No. No, Christina, you're still going to let it walk too? Okay. What, what is it about that then that makes you say, you know what, that's not a shot that I want to take? I'm not that hungry. <laughs> I, I like, it doesn't matter whether it's hunting season or not. I like seeing game and I respect them. And that's just not something that I want to do. Okay. Okay. Christina, what about you? Any reason you might take that doe at all? Uh, if I were a hunter, no, still. <laughs> okay. 
It just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, okay. I don't know what the ethical, unethical you know, side of that is, except for when you see a mama with her babies, you'll leave them alone. <laughs> okay. What, what if I add one last element to the conversation where we are at a ranch in Southwest Montana that is just overpopulated with whitetails and needs to cull some of that population from, um, from their fields. Does that change your mind at all? It's a farm fenced? Uh, it's a ranch. There is fencing, but the deer can move freely. But there's just, there's too many of them. And mom and two, two fawns walk out. Do you take mom? Boy, tough decision there, huh? I, I've done damage hunts, but generally they're January where you don't run into that, you know? Okay. Okay. Well, by January, the fawns are a little bit bigger, but you can, you can still tell that they're that you can year. see that they're younger deer, but they're not necessarily with their moms or anything at that point. They're okay. with the group. You know what I mean? Okay. So I, as we as we talk about what is and what is not ethical, there there is um, there is the sense in when a decision at one moment maybe is good, maybe is the right one for us at that point. But as you get more information or circumstances change it moves just a little bit. You know, for me in, in that instance, I, I do have a ranch in Dillon that I do whitetail population management on. And um, I try and take every mature doe that I can, regardless if she's got fawns or not. Uh, and, and it is really just about population control. There's, there's, um, there's just so many. And what they're doing to the habitat uh, is um, not sustainable. And so we need to do, we need to do management control in that place. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of, uh, something that pulls at your heartstrings when you shoot a doe and there's two fawns and now you see them in the field running around without her. But, um, the statistically they're, they've got a 90% plus chance of, of being okay through the winter. So there's, there's really not, um, a reason biologically to not harvest that animal. And so all of that, um, like we just talked about, that's the behavior that we're talking about with our ethical behavior. Um, it's the conduct seen in the field. And so uh, I, I like this quote by a guy named Aldo Leopold. Uh, he wrote a book called Sand County Almanac. He wrote a bunch of other books called The Father of Wildlife Management. Um, but he, he said a peculiar virtue in wildlife ethics is that the hunter ordinarily has no gallery to applaud or disapprove of his conduct whatever his acts, they are dictated by his own conscience rather than that of onlookers. And it is difficult to exaggerate the importance of this fact. And I think that's where we come back to where we, we need to be looking at where um, we draw these ethics from. And, and at the end of the day, does it sit well with us or not? And, and if it doesn't, reevaluating those actions for, for a moment to see what we can do next time that we wouldn't have that, um, that searing of the conscience, so to speak. Thoughts so far? Yeah, it just kind of depends on the situation and stuff like that, I, I would think. Um, but generally, that's just how I feel. I've always tried not to shoot a doe with Juan standing on her side, you know? Yeah. What about you, Christina, thoughts so far? Well, <clears throat> I think people who actually hunt would have some, you know, basis for doing culling and, you know, that kind of thing. Okay. Like what you're saying of, um, like my my early exposure to hunting in Montana was in 2012 when the wolves were a big deal, the reintroduction of things and just the mess that the political system was making out of, mm -hmm. you know, that whole subject. So I'm, 
when I know I'm much more sympathetic to like what you're having to deal with as a landowner and being overrun or overpopulated, you know, with the destruction of where human beings are trying to function than I am of, you know, the, of the heartstring, I guess. But that's also me saying that from a non-hunter, never been a hunter, never planning to be a hunter, you know, kind of, kind of position, but being, being sympathetic to the, you know, just the navigation that farmers and uh, ranchers and, you know, that kind of thing are having to deal with. Yeah. 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 Good thoughts. You know, on that, on you being a ranch owner as well with, and wanting to shoot them that way, for me personally, I would feel better late season, like at the end of season, maybe shooting those. Some fawns are a whole lot more mature than I would say opening day. Yeah. Um, yeah, for, for that unit, um, there is no special depredation hunts past Thanksgiving weekend. So Yeah, so I mean, if you're that last week, you don't find too many wet does, but opening day, you can find a wet doe. It's not that hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I would tell you, I, I've, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's very possible for those does to have not got bred in that first cycle. And so they, they can, they can have, they can still have milk uh, into late November like that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, hard to tell that, hard to know that. Um, but the, yeah, the bigger point I think there was, was just um, using your own conscience to, to make some determinations there on what you would or would not do. And, you know, for me, having um, a, a, an opportunity to uh, do some some population management, fill some freezers, not only for myself but for for neighbors, uh, I think that's something that uh, um, that I definitely take advantage of. Uh, and so, when we start to look at ethics, it it definitely impacts uh, every aspect of what we do, and when we talk about how we actually hunt, what weapons we're using, we can discuss whether or not, you know, um, using archery gear is as ethical as using a rifle or not, and um, have a, a friendly debate there if we wanted to. We could talk about the animals that we pursued. Christina, you talked just about the wolf, and uh, we've hunted wolves in Montana since Oh, nine? I want to say that's right. I don't know why. I want to say 2009, but, uh, and so the, uh, there's still a lot of people passionate about wolf uh, restoration and, and not hunting them. But I think probably on more people's mind when we talk about charismatic megafauna is the, the big old grizzly bear, right? And whether or not we, we hunt those. And so how we are as uh, ethical hunters can definitely play into that. Um, you know, when we talk about the aspirations of the hunt, we can, uh, why it is that we're actually out there hunting, whether it's um, for the enjoyment of it, whether we're trying to um, procure food, uh, whether there is uh, something therapeutic about um, just being uh, in, in the wild places. So, um, all of that uh, can can also be impacted on on just where your ethics take you as a hunter. And then we'll talk about this one just a little bit later, but how you represent the hunt. And I think this one's really important because um, very rarely do people who don't hunt see these first three. And very often they see how it is that you, either show pictures or talk about or you know throw that deer on top of the hood of your car and drive around town with it for two weeks um so how you represent the hunt people see that as well and and that really impacts their their opinions their views on on hunting and so i i think when we talk about uh ethics and hunting we can't just limit it to whether or not we're going to pull a trigger on on an animal that we see but how we actually, um, how we do all aspects of, of hunting is also an ethical um, 
uh, study as well, I think. And so when I talk about hunting in, in my ethics classes, there, there are seven big ideas that I really start to focus on when uh, I, I dig a little bit deeper. And we've got what, uh, I'm about 15 minutes or so to do what I usually do in about two and a half hours. So we're gonna streamline a little bit. So these seven points here, uh, we're gonna talk about each one just a little bit, but uh, they, they all kind of, they all have their place and they all have uh, a worthiness that if we could spend more time on, that'd be great. But I also think it, that no matter how small our time frame is, it's really important that we, we take a moment for each one. Uh, definitely could spend more on the first two. Those are really my, my, my two um, favorites, so to speak. But I think all seven have, a, have an, uh, a necessary place when it comes to hunting. And so you've got two people here, this guy on the left, most people recognize him, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, uh, most uh, Roosevelt um, uh, scholars, uh, refer to him as TR. Uh, a lot of people call him Teddy, but uh, he didn't actually like being called Teddy. Um, people have addressed him as um, either Colonel or Mr. President or Mr. Roosevelt prior to his office times. So uh, I think out of respect to him and just everything that he's done for us, uh, I refer to him as TR. Uh, the guy on the right, George Bird Grinnell, uh, was uh, a blue blood, same kind of uh, time frame as, as TR. Uh, there's a funny story where, where Theodore Roosevelt wrote this book and George Bird Grinnell, who owned uh, Forest and Stream at the time, a magazine that turned into Field and Stream, he wrote a pretty negative review of it. And so TR storms down the street in New York City, runs into uh, George Bird Grinnell's office and tries to give him what for. And George Bird Grinnell threw it right back at him and they, they became lifelong friends. In fact, uh, if you read anything about George Bird Grinnell, you'll, you'll quickly understand that if it wasn't for Grinnell, there would not be the TR that we have today. Uh, really, Grinnell was the brains and the, the understanding and the eloquence behind TR. Not that TR was a, a dumb guy at all or unable to speak on his own accord, but uh, Grinnell was definitely the, the intelligence um, behind it. And, and Theodore Roosevelt used his pulpit to really just push forward the, uh, the cause of conservation, which is what we have here at the bottom in the definition there. Uh, it's the wise and prudent use uh, of resources without wasting them. And uh, there's a competing uh, idea out there to conservation. Does anybody know what it might be? Uh, the non-use of? <laughs> yeah, what would that be? I can't remember. <laughs> starts with a P. It starts with a P. Preservation. So there's the idea uh -oh. of conservation versus preservation. And there's a really good book um, called Natural Rivals. And you've got two fathers of, of these competing ideas, John Muir with preservation and um, Gifford Pinchot, mm -hmm. the father of the U.S. Forest Service, talking about conservation and uh, how they were actually really good friends. And uh, one was kind of a mentor and the other, the protege. And, and so um, instead of it being an either or, I think there are elements in this world that we would want to preserve like Yellowstone Park. We all like going there and seeing that, but we also all like wood for our houses. And so we use our forest that way as well. So these guys came up with the idea of fair chase and I'm gonna kind of just breeze through these for you. Um, it's really important to know that the, the idea is that in this present definition of fair chase that we as sportsmen, we limit ourselves and so that we don't have an improper or unfair ad advantage over the animals that we hunt. And, and that's the big idea there. Um, and Jim Posowitz wrote a book called Beyond Fair Chase. We lost Jim uh, just last year, but he a uh, really great guy. And uh, what he was talking about in his book here is that there needs to be a balance in the technology and the advantages that we use as humans versus the animals that we're, we're, um, we're hunting so that we occasionally succeed, but the animals generally succeed. And I think it's really important that we, we, we learn how to strike that balance. And 
And so that idea of fair chase comes into play there. Uh, the hunter's paradox is a question that I like to spend a lot of time on. We, we just don't have um, the, the minutes tonight to, to dive into it, but it asks the question, how can you kill what you claim to love? Which really at first blush makes you think for just a moment. Um, but what it's really going to is, is that people really want to know how it is that you can claim to, to, to love deer or elk or ducks or whatever it is that you're pursuing and still pull a trigger on ending, ending their life and putting uh, violence and destruction into the equation. And so these three guys um, really kind of give us an idea of, of uh, how we can uh, respond to that question, which I think is really important for us as hunters to consider for, um, for a minute. But Hank Schott, who's a, a wild chef, says um, that he kills when he's hungry, he drinks in nature's great pageant when he's not, and in both there is bliss. And so for him, there is a purpose um, in, in the kill. It's not um, wasted, and it's not just something that uh, goes unappreciated. Uh, this guy here, Jose Ortega y Gasset, was a Spanish philosopher, lived about 80 years ago, and he said um, that, that death is an essential part of the hunt. And that last part of that quote is what he's often quoted about, says, to sum up, one does not hunt in order to kill. On the contrary, one kills in order to have hunted. And so uh, there's this necessity to what we're doing, that there's the intent whether or not we pull the trigger, we're still carrying a weapon that we're gonna go out and um, hunt those, those animals. And so death is a necessary part of that hunt. And then Fred Bear, really great quote here, says that uh, loving the animal, there's still an honor and a reverence that we pay to them, even though there is a killing there. He says that he's always tempered his killing with respect for the game pursued. He sees the animal not only as a target, but as a living creature with more freedom than I will ever have. I take that life if I can with regret as well as joy and with the sure knowledge that nature's way of fang and claw and starvation are a far crueler fate than I bestow. And so I think there's something there where, yes, even though we're killing an animal, there's, there's still... Um, Again, the paradox is the idea where we, we have some regret, we have some sorrow, but there's also, there's joy and there's satisfaction in, in that, that whole uh, pursuit. Thoughts on that? I'd much rather see hunting than see them starve to death because overpopulation. So let's go back to that ranch then, Brad. The animals are starving themselves to death. Mom walks out and she's all scrawny. And the, the two fawns walk out and they're even scrawnier still. And you can totally tell they're starving to death. Do you shoot that doe now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would. All right. In that um, case, I would. Well, at least we know what it takes now to get you to that point, Brad. <laughs> um. And then uh, big idea number three that I talk about, uh, I put this picture up here and I, I ask everybody, okay, when you look at this picture, what's your immediate reaction? And I'm, I'm, I'm watching your faces right now. So that tells me quite a bit. Yeah, not good. <laughs> yeah. So. That uh, me off. <laughs> yeah. You know, and we don't know any context behind this picture, but I do put it up because there's something about it that that's just not right. Right. There's Correct. something about it that we we just we instinctively know that that's not how it's supposed to be. And so when I talk about becoming an evolving hunter, uh, I talk about this little cycle here where it takes a lot of skill and and those skills require constant evaluation. And then after you have evaluated them, you need to be honest about where it is that you're lacking in and then put the work in in order to bring that skill up to par. Right. But then what happens? Uh, animals, they're chaotic, they're unpredictable, they do things that we just were not planning on them doing. 
And so they throw this curveball at us that requires us to, again, find another skill. And so the easy, um, the easy one that I go to is, you know, you're out elk hunting in September with your bow and it's beautiful out and you get, you know, a hundred yards from an elk and all of a sudden that elk uh, runs off and then you feel the wind on the back of your neck. And what have you not done? You haven't played that wind right. So you got to learn how to check the wind, how to play the wind. And then the cycle begins all over again. And the fun part is, is that maybe it's not fun, but it, I don't think uh, it ever, it ever really ends. Um, you should, you know, always be learning more and more. Um, you know, I, I, I'm very blessed to be able to hunt as much as I do. And, and I got to, or a time that I come out of the field uh, that I, I don't bring something new with me or uh, a question that I need to answer with me so that I can be, again, more proficient and, and um, more effective as a hunter. Um, and so this is where I talk uh, for a little while about the, the having that attitude of being a lifelong a uh, learner. Uh, I don't think we ever get to the point where we arrive, no matter how um, how effective we have been or, or how uh, how many animals or tags that we've punched at the end of the season. I mean, and you can look at my office and it, it looks like a lot. And and uh, if you were to go to my Instagram, you could see, you know, my the exploits from this this past year. Um, and you would think, well, you know, ever you know, he knows what he's doing, but. Uh, you know, I, I love to learn um, from different cultures, whether it's here in North America or it's around the world or from other people that have done it and had success in a way that I've not. And so what can I draw from them that might make me a better hunter? And again, I think it's just about expanding your toolbox. And I may only use that tool one more time in my life, but now I've got it just in case I ever needed it. And so um, really there's, there's, there's not just this moment that you just, you like, like the example I just used, you have arrived as a hunter. I think you're always kind of continuing to become better and better. And what is looking for, for ways that you can refine um, those skills that you have. Um, can you, can you see this picture very well behind the screen here? Can you see that Brad? Yeah. I can see it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it looks a little light on my screen right now, but, um, you know, this is a, an area where I think in, in American hunting culture, we, we've missed out. We don't really have a, a common um, ritual or tradition for hunting um, that we all just kind of practice. In Eastern Europe and... Um, you know, countries, uh, well, really almost all of Europe now, they practice this, um, this ritual called Letzebitzen, which means last bite in German. And you can see that bottom picture, they would place a sprig of green um, plant matter, and they would put that in the animal's mouth. And again, it's just a sign and a recognition of um, that animal sacrifice that, um, that their life is now going to become part of your life. And in the top right there, you can see uh, the Cherokee would place a deer's head high up in a tree so that it could still continue to watch the sunrises and sunset. There's something poetic about that, right? But I think what it comes back to is that it just shows that um, there's a recognition of, of, of a violence being um, acted upon an animal and, and, and there was a life there. And so the recognition of that sacrifice, I think is really important. And if we had time to dive into that, I would, I, I, we would spend some, uh, we, we would look at what is it that we could do in American hunting culture that might recapture that idea. Is there something that we could do as a culture that would be universal in knowing that, um, this is what's done to pay respect to that animal. You know, for me personally, um, when I come up on that animal, uh, it's, it's just me placing my hand uh, 
uh, on an animal, usually on its lung um, chest area. And it's just taking a moment before anything else happens that I know what I've just done and the necessity of it. Um, and, and, and again, just recognizing that that animal is now um, going to become part of my life. Um, let's see, respect for the pursuit, how we actually hunt. Um, I'll, I'll move past that one to talk about um, this one, this one right here. So the idea of self-policing when it comes to uh, other hunters in the field. And the reason I bring this up is because the number one issue that we have as hunters is, is um, it's a self-made problem. And so I see, I show people this picture in the bottom right corner. Can you guys see this clearly? Do you, anybody seen this before? Know what this is? Does that look like a coyote? Kind of, yeah. Does that look like a coyote that was ran over by a snowmobile? Oh, I guess it could be. I didn't think that. <laughs> yeah. So this happened a couple of years ago in Wyoming. Um, a couple of, of guys were on snowmobiles and they, they ran a coyote over and uh, killed it and then took this picture and posted it up on social media. And the, the backlash that this has caused um, is incredible because this is actually at the time was not illegal to be done in, in Wyoming, but the, there's, there's no, there's nothing ethical about this at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so it actually did two things. One, I think it raised last I checked about $25 million for anti-hunting causes, which is one picture posted by hunters. That's a big deal. And the other thing that it did was spur on um, new legislation in Wyoming to make this illegal. And so this is when we start to talk about why we need to self-police as other hunters. And how do we do that? Because if we don't, this kind of stuff happens. And we need to ask the question, um, do we want those particular types of people in our boat? Or do we need to say, you guys need to go your own way? Because hunters have done more to hurt hunting than anti-hunters probably ever will. And I think it's really important to recognize that fact. And so we need to be willing and able to respectfully but clearly speak out when we have hunting behavior that's just not right. And so last fall, there was um, over in um, White Sulphur Springs area, there was a, a big uh, elk shootout, so to speak. And um, a lot of elk were shot, a lot of elk were left, um, some were wounded, um, but basically hunters encircled a, a big group on um, a block management area. And it became national news um, and really poor hunting behavior. And so what can we do as hunters to say, that's not something that we agree with? And how can we speak out in a way that's respectful, but also clear that what we expect of other hunters is more than that, is a, a, a fair chase pursuit of, of those animals. And so I bring up this picture here. You guys know who this is? Yes. Elmer Fudd. <laughs> yeah, can you see what Elmer Fudd still has in this picture? Yeah. I, I don't know if they, did they get rid of his gun? I don't keep up with pop culture too much, but I thought I heard somewhere that cancel culture got a hold of him and took his gun away. Um, but what's really telling about Elmer Fudd is that when you look at anti-hunting um, forums and, and blog posts and things like that, this is how they describe hunters. They call them Fudds. And, and it's kind of appropriate, right? Where you've got this um, you know, overweight, kind of uh, doesn't know quite what he's doing, always getting outsmarted by the other animals, um, just kind of a, 
a dopey kind of character. And, and that's the image that uh, a lot of hunters have, have portrayed for us. And so um, we could talk about hunting etiquette, um, but for the sake of time, we'll just kind of push through this. But I want to leave you with this little, this little quote here at the bottom. Uh, hunters used to be heroes in society. And if you were to look at the fairy tale, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, it was the huntsman or the woodsman or the woodcutter, as he's now called. Um, that was the hero in that. And that was the guy who was out in the woods and he knew the woods, but he was a hunter. And um, you don't have to go very far to find hunters being the villains now in, um, in a lot of movies. Bambi comes to mind very quickly. And so when we talk about representing the hunt, uh, we need to talk about how we can tell good stories and how we can portray hunting in a way that's um, positive, but also reflects um, you know, the nature of, of what happens. I don't shy away from hero shots, as you might call them, but I make sure that I, I try and clean up the mess as I can. Um, and I try to make the animal the focus of that picture. Uh, I remove weapons. You know, I'm respectful, so I'm not sitting on top of the animal. Uh, I try and tuck uh, tongues back into place. You know, I just, uh, again, make sure that I am I'm, I'm, I'm representing as well as I can. And, and this is really the number one issue that hunters have is how they represent themselves uh, across the internet. Because it doesn't take much for somebody to go right click, save, and then spread this everywhere else when it's a picture that maybe you don't want to have out there. Um, and, uh, and then I throw this last slide up because these are, these are some really good books here. Uh, if you want to dive deeper into hunting culture, hunting ethics, and, and look um, into uh, some of these different topics a little bit more, definitely a lot of good reading here. If there's one that I would recommend here, it's called Meditations on Hunting by Jose Ortega y Gasset. If you can find a copy uh, for less than 100 bucks, you should probably buy it. Um, absolutely well worth it. So, um, but guys, that's kind of my. 45 minute, one hour hunting culture ethics class. Um, questions, thoughts? None? You guys I think are, a lot of ethics come with knowing your own skill level and your own ethic and your own, what would you call it, uh, abilities or whatever and making the decision at that point, whether that's something you're gonna shoot at or not. Okay. For ethics, personally, and as far as those pictures are concerned, yeah. Some people are really into bragging that up. But basically, I will share mine with my hunting friends and that's it. Mm -hmm. In my circle. Yeah, you know, Brad, I think, uh, I think there's some wisdom in that. Um, keeping that circle small. I don't need to brag about killing something. If I get a trophy, it's a personal trophy. You know, I'm not out to tell the whole world that I can kill the biggest elk there is. Yeah. Christina, thoughts from you as a non-hunter becoming a hunter? Is that right? No, I um, do Georgia Veterans Association. So Sam, we're, we're hoping to do the same kind of training in Georgia one day and do different kinds of hunts down here. Okay, great. But I, no, I'm not a hunter and no, not becoming one. Just trying to gather as much as I can for the possibility of repeating and duplicating yeah. what, sure. what's been doing. So it's good. It's great information. I think it's probably something anybody that <clears throat> does it as a hobby or as a lifestyle or you know um a living you know would would really benefit from so thanks for going through all of it yeah. really good well guys thanks for being a good uh, class of two tonight definitely my smallest class i've ever taught <laughs> but uh yeah glad uh, glad to have been a part tonight i'm not sure um if Steve was going to come back or not, but he said just to close out. So 
Okay. That's what I'll do. And um, yeah, thanks guys. Yeah, that, thank you. That right. Hunter, you took that fish and game hunting class, right? You said? I do what now? You teach that fish and game hunting class? Well, I teach Hunter Ed for FWP. Okay. And I live here in Stevensville. Um, but then uh, I also uh, lead the Montana Master Hunter Program, which is. Yeah, I was kind of interested in that. Yeah, I thought of applying this year, but I, I thought I'd wait until it was in Missoula. Yep, as we got a class there next year. Traveling and time and stuff to do that, you know. Yep. Yeah, we have a class in Missoula next year, so definitely. I would it will be in next year. It will be in Missoula. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, guys. Well, have a great night, everybody. Well, thanks you too. Okay, thank you. Bye. All. See you, Brad. See you.